have a V10. V10 noises. <gasps> Hello and welcome back to Lead Follow. And this is a momentous day, a very, rem a very rememberable day. I'm never going to forget this day. I've had lots and lots of V8s over the years, but I've never had a V10 or a V12. But now I've got a V10 and it is glorious. very light on the steering it's, it, it moves really really well it doesn't, doesn't feel <coughs> how much it actually weighs it feels much more svelte I've literally just picked up from my friend Michael's house dropped off the MR2 said goodbye to that car and jumped straight into project car number two for the channel and I'm over the moon um, I still think that I did much better out of this uh, deal than he did so I feel very very bad and uh, we'll probably be buying him multiple multiple beers uh, down the pub in the future uh, but what a lovely car it's not without its faults uh, one of the reasons he was happy to do a swap is that there was pretty much nothing to do at all on the MR2 um, it just gone through a brand new MOT and I'd spent so much time and money on it, it no engine lights nothing nothing he's doing on that car at all however on this this does have a few faults let me just go through those with you now while we're uh, while we're talking um, so firstly let's talk about the engine engine is in good health however it does have a engine code that pops up every so often uh, an eml light which let's face it it's an audi it was probably coming out the factory brand new with an engine light let's be honest so that is caused by a intermittent misfire and uh, he's changed out a few of the coils in the past the radio's just come on how did that happen um yeah he's changed a couple of the coils in the past and fixed the issue but it's now just moved to a different cylinder so it just needs probably some more coils um the two new ones he fitted were decent bosch ones um and the others are kind of like unbranded i i don't know whether they're chinese or whatever but anyway i'm just going to get another eight bosch ones so i've got a full set of 10 bosch ones that should knock that on the head. If the misfire continues to happen, it could be that the valves are a bit coked up from the direct ejection, which is another common issue on these. So it might be uh, something I'm gonna need to look at. However, it's not really a problem because the second issue with this car is, is that it's got a leak from the valley gasket. So the valley gasket is right in the middle of the V underneath the intake manifold. So I've actually got to strip down the top of the engine and locate this gasket and change it he's given me the gasket luckily and while i'm in there i will inspect and clean all of the intake ports anyway so not a big issue if the misfire continues um other issues we've got airbag light on this was happening when he put the rear seats down one day and then it's been on ever since uh, he has checked but he can't really find anything wrong with it luckily for me my partner in crime edward he has a plug-in uh, like mechanics computer which reads bag stuff so uh volkswagen audi group for those who don't know what i mean by that term so we shouldn't have a problem locating whichever airbag sensor is causing the issues and putting that right um uh, what else we got uh, there's a little problem with the door at the back uh, when you press the button that opens it and closes it sometimes it gets stuck so I'm gonna remove the motor check if it needs just a bit of greasing or whether it's just a bit tired and replace if necessary um, one of the tires is uh, an advisory on the last MOT 
Um, he's got uh, three Han Cooks on three corners, Ventus S2s, I think. And then on the corner, which is the one where he said uh, on the MOT it was it was low thread, um, low tread, is that uh, that is a Continental. So what I'm going to probably try to do is get a matching Ventus and just knock that on the head for matching tyres. Excellent. Um, what else we got? On the MOT there was advisory for uh, the discs being uh, corroded, pitted, etc. Uh, not a big deal. I'm going to take this one on the track anyway eventually, so I will probably replace all the discs for some nice shiny M-Tech discs. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to go grooved this time. They were fantastic on the MR2. However, as I was telling Michael, if you go down a dual carriageway at about 40 or 50 and you pop the window on the MR2, and you're in the right lane, right next to the centre reservation, you can hear the brakes off of the centre reservation uh, guard frame. Uh, all you hear is a and I just assume it is the pads running over the grooves in the discs. Simple as that. Because it didn't do it on the old pads and discs. Um, so I might go for drilled or dimpled. I'm not quite sure. Uh, drilled. You hear horror stories about people buying aftermarket drill brakes and the drill holes uh, are just a source for cracks. So I might just go for some flat Please ones with dimples. Will you shut up? Oh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, it, it, it needs a little bit of uh, tiling up here and there. The paint is a little bit matte in certain areas. It's going to need a buff, a polish. The chrome is a little iffy in places on the exterior so um, again I might try to polish that it could be that the chrome's a bit too far gone though and it needs to either be replaced or or painted um, the front grille is missing a little bit of chrome um, so I'll either replace that missing bit of chrome or I am quite tempted to put the RS6 grille on because the RS6 grille has kind of a honeycomb design you can still get it with the chrome surround but if I choose to de-chrome the car, which is one of the things Michael was planning on doing, is that I can get that grill with a matte black surround, so, yeah, or, or, or a gloss, but will you shut up? Please um, leave a roundabout at the second exit. But yes, it rides really, really nice. Um, it's a lovely interior. Um, it's done about the same miles as the MR2, just over 100,000. Uh, but uh, because it's got leather and not cloth like the MR2, the wear does show yeah, a, lot, a lot clearer in this car. So I'm going to have to spend some time um, cleaning up the seats, maybe getting some of the uh, coloured uh, waxy stuff so that as you treat the seats it fills in all the cracks and uh, reduces the uh, what the damage looks like. So a bit of cracking, especially in the driver's side bolster. Um, the steering wheel probably the worst part of the interior to be honest I mean it's got a roundabout at the second exit and continue to follow the a you and I are not gonna get along how do I how do I kill you okay I I don't know what I've done but she seems to have shut up now so we're going over roundabout here she hasn't I haven't heard a peep out of her so um, yeah the steering wheel that's what I was talking about so the steering wheel is a bit worn I know you can send your steering wheels off to there's quite a lot of people on eBay who you can send your steering wheel to and they will re-trim it in leather uh, might just buy one of those uh, the buttons on the uh, driver's side door they've kind of got kind of gone white um, as they've been used uh, the, the black has just worn off of them passenger side looks like it's going as well I mean it's just those little things I'm gonna I'm gonna just do over time um, but yeah I'm really looking forward to this it's a it's a car and an engine that I've always wanted to have uh, wanted to experience this uh, this this V10 and I can see I can see this is gonna be a lot of fun it's it's not without its problems it's gonna take some time and money to get it all ship shape but uh, it should be a fantastic project car for the channel and um, I can't wait to take it to Nur actually I think it'd be great for the long road trip there it's gonna be so comfortable and then once we get on track four-wheel drive 430 ish horsepower lovely and if anything goes wrong I'm in the right country for spare parts okay so the other thing that was an advisory on the MOT was the front passenger side upper suspension had some kind of knock or a bit of play in it um, it's one of those things that 
I can't really hear it to be honest and I could probably ignore it but an advisory is only just going to become a failure eventually so while I'm aware of it I'm going to check it out replace any parts that need replacing and then I haven't got to worry about it failing the car in the future uh, which is a big inconvenience because then the car's basically off the road at least while it's on an advisory you can still use it this thing does like a drink so I shall top her up while I'm here so let me take you through some of the things that actually annoy me on this car. And I think it's just Audi being pedantic. But the way I see it is that you should be able to jump into any car, no matter who makes it. And you should be able to understand how to use it. You know, the basic things like, you know, they're making systems that for, to fix problems that don't really exist. So a great example of this is the glove box. So I don't know, lots of Audi owners might be out there screaming at the TV right now, just saying, well, it's obvious how to open it. Well, for me, it wasn't. I had to check the instruction manual and then I found out they made an electronic button for it. Why? Why? What's wrong with a, a handle? You know, everybody else uses a handle. You get a Lexus, it's got a handle for the glove box. That's just fixing a problem that never existed. Uh, moving on to the heater controls. Right, you'll notice there is only one knob for the passenger and one knob for the driver. Okay, now this took me a while to, to, to figure out, but essentially one knob does everything. So if I want to change the temperature or the blower, which one's this, the blower? Let me just, oh, no, it's gone to temperature now. Okay, so I can adjust the temperature. If I press it again, goes back to that no temperature again why is this so hard to maybe I've got to press this ah now I press that I can adjust the blower okay right so that kind of makes sense and then we've got the seat heater that makes sense the directions I want the blower so if I want it going straight towards me Okay, you can, you can kind of see the, the thinking behind here. Like, they can, they can do everything with one knob. But, but why? You know, it, it just seems that you're, again, you're fixing a problem that didn't really exist. Okay, so next crazy thing is the way you start this car. So we've got a key that goes in the ignition barrel as normal. You can turn it, that will start the engine. However, maybe you don't want to turn it. Maybe you want to have a push start. Well, that's fine. You put your key in and then you have a push start button. What the hell? Why is there two ways of starting this car? Okay, and then you get to the end of your drive. Okay, well, you can turn it off by turning the key barrel the other way. Or you push the separate engine stop button. What? Why has it got an engine stop and engine start? Surely one button could have done the job of two here. Or you got a key. You don't even need buttons. Just start and stop with the key. What the hell? So this is my first Audi ever. Uh, my first VAG car, actually, ever. And I'm already starting to wonder how bored the designers were, the fact that they've had to do things like this to keep themselves entertained. It's just, it just, it's not needed. So we're all fueled up, ready to rock. And little secret, my GoPro actually ran out of battery juice as I was filling up. So this is actually the next day. I've dressed exactly the same, so nobody's the wiser. But uh, the good thing about this being the next day is that the other night I was able to fit all the new coils so no more misfire everything runs fine and we can properly push the car now make some really cool v10 noises um, it's not really much point in doing a video on changing coil packs on these because you literally you pop the bonnet there they are you just unclip them pull them out put the new ones in reclip them there's not really much of a challenge there uh, the coils at the back, like number 5, which is in the back of the left side, and number 10, which is the back of the right side, if you're looking at the engine, uh, those are a bit tight in there, like you have to unscrew the coolant reservoir and the power steering reservoir, just to move them out of the way to give yourself a bit of access to remove those, but otherwise, a bit of a doddle really, yeah, I mean, it does help if you've got an extra pair of hands, so that somebody can hold stuff out of the way while you're trying to remove it, my friend Vic was over, he gave me a hand doing that, funny enough. So, yeah, it went pretty straightforward. So, let's have some fun. I'm not going to use the paddles, I'm just going to put it in sport mode, which ups the revs, and let's go!
crap, that's fun. Yeah, so for some reason, when you put it into sports mode, the miles per gallon gauge just goes to lines as though it's like, there's no point in me being in this party. But I think this is a pretty good point to end the video. So I hope you've enjoyed the first in the series of the Audi S6 V10 videos. Uh, we're gonna get down and dirty with this car. Lots of things that need fixing on this. Luckily, coil packs, no longer one of them. I can strike through that on the list. Um, and yeah, we're gonna have some great fun and we're definitely, definitely gonna take this thing on a track day. I think somewhere like Spa, early next year would be fantastic with the uh the Mors, is it Mors? no i'm thinking of le mans more sand straight is le mans um what's the corner in spa uh eau rouge that's the one i'm thinking of right taking this through eau rouge i think would be amazing really amazing and then you've got the straight after eau rouge oh wow. it's gonna be fantastic cannot wait to take this thing out on track so thank you very much for watching Please like, subscribe if you're not already doing so, and I hope to see you again on more V10 Audi videos. So, take care. Bye for now.